Okay, good evening. So simple, selfish, and hungover. We're going to have a little think about leadership, and I'm hopefully going to provide you with a bit of a different perspective and perhaps some new ideas. And we're going to start, that's me, I'm going to start with an image from my research. This little bit in the corner, that's me there, and that's a bunch of sheep which I'm studying. And this is in Australia. So much to the surprise and delight of the local Australians that Welshmen went all the way to Australia to study sheep. <laughs> One of the reasons I was there was that I was able to get a really great data set about these sheep. So I was interested in how they interact with each other. And what we were able to do was put these backpacks on the sheep. So each of these little blue boxes contain a GPS, and those GPS devices tell me where the sheep are every second and how they're interacting with each other. So I'm going to play you in a moment is a little movie of the data that we collected and this is the projection of that data. So these red blobs are the sheep and this blue blob down here is a sheepdog which I put the GPS collar on her as well. And so I'll play it now for you and you'll see what happens when the sheepdog approaches the sheep and you'll see how they interact with each other and how they respond to the dog. So there we are, off she goes. They all form a really dense flock, and then she sits behind them and starts moving them down to this bottom corner. So these technologies allow me a really great insight into what's going on, and they provide us with data that we've never had before, and we can look at how, how individuals are interacting in these places. All right? So when we look at these, it's nice fun to look at from this aerial view, but from my perspective as a biologist, I get to answer two questions normally. I'm interested in why the sheep are acting like they are, so what's the point of their behavior, and then secondly, how they're doing it, so what they're doing to be, enable them to perform these types of behavior. So the why question is pretty similar to many schools of fish or flocks of birds. Most of the reasons for flocking like this are anti-predator benefits, so they are coming together to reduce their chances of being eaten. So there's a hundred odd of you in the audience here. So if a lioness came streaming down the back past the bar into the room here, because you're in a group of a hundred, you have a 99 out of a hundred chance of being okay. One of you will get eaten. Okay, so that is if all else is being equal. And this is basically a selfish reason for grouping. You're diluting the risk, your own risk, of encountering a problem. So this is a selfish reason for flocking, a selfish reason for grouping, and it's one of the main reasons underlying the type of behavior that you just saw the sheep performing there. And if you look at the data, um, which is behind, behind us there, I said just now it's, you'd have 99 out of 100 chance. Actually, you guys at the back, in the back right as I'm looking at you, you probably don't have a 99 out of 100 chance of staying alive because she's going to come streaming right at you. So what you need to do is get yourself into the middle of the crowd to avoid being eaten. And that's a, a process or a theory that was proposed um, in the middle of the last century by the late Bill Hamilton, and it's called the selfish herd theory. And so that's putting your, somebody else between you and harm's way, okay? So it's a selfish reason for grouping. And what this graph shows you is the time since the dog started approaching, so that dog started running, and then the distance of each sheep from the center of the flock. So if you're already in the center, you stay in the center. You've got a nice safe place. Whereas if you're out on the edge, you run hell for leather into the middle of that flock to avoid being at the edge. So what we've got is a selfish reason for flocking, although it looks highly cooperative, like they're all working for each other, they're in, they're, they have very self-interests in what they're doing. How do they do it? It looks quite complicated. It happens really fast. Suddenly all the sheep are together and there's a dog chasing them and it all happens very quickly. The way that we try and understand how they do it is we build computer simulations of the behavior that we're observing. So we recreate the patterns we've observed in the lab on a computer and see if we can pick out the behavioral rules that the individuals are following. And what we find time and time again, whether we're looking at sheep or birds or fish or monkeys or crowds of people, that simple and local rules of interaction, so that's movements between one another, create these global or group level patterns of behavior. And what I mean by simple and local is that if you are too close to another individual, you move away from them, 
too far, you're attracted to them. Maybe you align your travel direction with them. And if you're too far away from them, you accelerate it. And these simple rules will create these collective patterns of behavior, which you often see with bird flocks and schools of fish. So these are simple local rules, and we've got self, selfish interests underlying these social interactions. And this is what the computer simulation looks like. And we have a lovely video showing you almost exactly the same as we saw with the real data. And we can recreate these patterns quite nicely. But when we build these models with these red dots and these blue, blue dots representing the individuals that I've observed, what we don't do is building any diversity. So we assume every agent, everything in this model is anonymous and they're identical. They're following the exact same rules. But we know that animals are not exactly the same. And these are two fish from our laboratory in Swansea. And it's speeded up, they're not that fast. And the one on the bottom lane, you can see she's moving around that environment quite happily. She's looking at a lot of it. And you probably haven't even seen the top fish. She's just sat in that plant. And these fish are two females, the same age. They've been eaten, eating the same in, in the week they've been observed. They have the same experiences. But one is much bolder and more exploratory than the other. And the interesting thing is if we retest these fish the week later, we'll find the same thing. Not the exact same behavior, but the bottom fish will be much more exploratory than the top fish. So these two fish have different personalities. And these different personalities become really important to their coordination. So if we were to take away this barrier in the middle and the two fish can interact, the greater the difference in the two personalities of the fish, the more coordinated they are in the behavior. So if you have two very similar personality fish, and you see how they're coordinated. They do worse in their terms of their coordination. So the diversity allows for coordination in these fish. And that's something that we find a lot in these animal systems when we study them. We find selfish interests that are being followed with simple rules, but we also see that diversity can elicit complementarity in social roles and solve coordination problems. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but we can represent it with a cartoon on the other side here. Two donkeys tied together with a rope, so they have to be together. Two food sources, if they both act exactly the same way, both try to lead or both try to follow, they'll get nowhere. Okay? Very simply, you need some trait between one of these donkeys that makes them act first and the other to follow, and you get a leader-follower dynamic, and then you both get to eat your food. Okay? So it's a very simple thing. You need differences to create and enable you to solve coordination problems. So you've got leader-follower dynamics, simple and selfish rules, underlying very complicated-looking behaviors that we're seeing in the animal systems that we're studying. And once you have these leader-follower dynamics, you can find them everywhere. So on the right-hand side, you're seeing two ants. These are little tiny rock ants studied by colleagues of mine in Bristol. And the ant at the front, she has some knowledge of a new nest site. It's a real new, a great nest site that she's found. And she's leading, literally teaching the ant behind her where that nest site is. And the one behind her is tapping her backside, following her to that new nest site. Okay? So she's teaching her the way. The guy on the left is one of the baboons which we studied in South Africa. They have a very strict linear dominance hierarchy. He's the alpha male. You often see him at the front of the troop leading them around their environment. But he doesn't lead through enforcing others or coercing them to follow. He leads by example, if you like. When he moves, he tends to be followed more often because he has many more social ties and stronger social bonds within that troop. So it's kind of a follow a friend rule that works in the baboons. But again, these are simple rules that are creating group level behaviors and leader follower dynamics. So that's a kind of introduction to the work which we do with the animal groups. And I've told you that they tend to be motivated by self-interest because if you are able to survive and reproduce better than your neighbors, those behaviors are going to be passed into ge next generations. They are simple. The rules tend to be not very cognitively demanding. And diversity in groups allows you to have leader-follow dynamics. So thinking about us and you lot, um, you're probably thinking, well, we're not, we're not simple. We're not that simple. And no, we have people winning Nobel Prizes all of the time, okay? So this is Harry Markowitz. He won a Nobel Prize for working out how to allocate your money if you want to maximize your income. So you've got a bunch of money, you want to work out how to allocate it. He produced a really great algorithm for asset allocation. Got him the Nobel Prize. But Harry, when he retired, 
he didn't use his own model of how to distribute his funds. He used a very simple heuristic, which he just allocated his money equally amongst the different funds he had available. So he won a Nobel Prize for this idea, and he didn't even use it himself. Okay, and that happens all the time. We are very capable of making complicated, weighing up complicated ideas and decisions and spending a lot of time on them. But most of you in everyday lives will use very simple rules of thumb, very simple heuristics, which are fast, and they tend to be on average accurate. Okay, so that's the type of decision making we use most often on a daily basis. Not all the time, but we tend to be quite simple too. Okay, so now you're thinking, well, I'm not selfish. In Wales, we are the most generous in the UK. Well done. Hey. Okay, so how can this be, how can we be selfish if we in Wales are the most generous in the UK? Well, men contribute more to charity when observed by a member of the opposite sex <laughs> than by a member of the same sex or no observer at all. Okay? And you men in the audience, when you're in a relationship, at the start of that romantic relationship, you give more money if you walk past a charity box than at the end of that relationship. Okay? So the act of giving is obviously great because it benefits the receiver, whether you give time or you give money. But there are also benefits to the actor in the giving. And in this case, it might result in higher reproductive success for the male by showing off his charity. Okay? So we are selfish fundamentally as well. At some level, these behaviors that we're performing allow us to survive and reproduce at a better and quicker rate than our neighbors who don't perform such activities. So we are simple, and we are selfish. And when we test people in these sorts of environments, these are people wearing those loggers on their heads, which the sheep had on. And they're performing a foraging experiment. They're collecting tokens, and they're putting them in the box in the middle. And they're trying to maximize their own individual benefits, and this is what the data look like. And when they're doing these sorts of patterns of behavior, what we find is they are using simple rules. They're copying each other a lot. And when they're copying each other, they're not copying each other at the same rate. They're copying certain individuals in these sorts of exercises. And what we find, not only in our research, but lots of research over the past 30, 40, 50 years, is that factors like age, sex, height, and weight all play a major role in determining our choice of leaders. Right? These are what people call hangovers from our evolutionary past. And what, by that, what I mean is, just 100,000 years ago, down in East Africa, Homo sapiens, us, started to colonize the rest of the world. So your ancestors in our very recent evolutionary past were hunting buffalo on the savanna, coping with conflicts with other tribes, trying to live life in a very different environment in which we live today. And in this sort of environment that your ancestors lived in, following a taller, more masculine um, person with more weight might have resulted in increased access to resources, greater territory, defense of something, more buffaloes to eat. Okay, so in those circumstances, those heuristics, those rules of thumb would have operated and would have done very well. But we live in Swansea, or many of you live in Swansea in the Swansea region, which is very different from that environment. And Mark Van Vert, a colleague of mine in, in Holland, he calls this a mismatch. There's a mismatch between the environment in which we live and operate now and the evolved heuristics which we have for following certain individuals. So they don't match up. And so... I've got a couple of examples to show you that this, this may be happening. If you think about the US election, where they have a two-party, two-candidate system, um, this is the height of all of the presidential candidates since 1900. First thing you can see is the line across. That's the average height of the US population, male population, for starters, okay? So straight away, we have a bias. There's very few female candidates in the US presidential elections. And then when we put the data up, First thing you can see is both winners and losers are taller than average height in the US, and the winners tend to be taller than the losers. Okay, so in the absence of other, any information, if you just have to follow two people, we tend to follow the taller person. Faces. There's some colleagues in Liverpool who did some great work looking at how people perceive faces when they're choosing leaders. They took John Kerry and George Bush's face George Bush has a more masculinized face than John Ke Kerry. 
And then they took a, an average face and made it look 30% more like George Bush or 30% more like John Kerry. Okay? And then they have these two faces and they present it to, to a group of people and they said, okay, all you have is these two faces, which one would you vote for? And what you see is George Bush-like face pinches it, 10% or so in it. Okay? So just on the faces, they're having a preference for George Bush. If you have another group of people and you do the exact same experiment and you say, these are the two faces, who are you going to choose? And there is a war on, you are at war with another country, then suddenly George Bush face wins by a landslide. Tell them there's peace, there's no problem, no outgroup conflict, you have to deal with internal problems in your country, and suddenly the John um, Kerry like face works. Okay, so these are heuristics, again, these are evolved rules which people are drawing on when they're making these decisions, and in these cases, they don't have any other information to make decisions on, so they're basing it on what they've got in front of them. And so, I'd like to argue that we are fundamentally simple, selfish, and hungover in the ways in which we interact socially, and especially in the ways in which we react to and choose our own leaders. Add to that that we further manipulate our environment. We've just had general elections in the UK. If Swansea West, where we are, we've got constituencies all over the UK. Swansea West, your vote is worth more, three and a half times more, than the average person living in the UK because of the numbers of people in Swansea West and the balance of power amongst the parties which are competing. So the average voting power is about 0.35. So most people's votes don't count for one vote. And that's why sometimes you can have parties and leaders coming into power which actually had less of the popular vote than the person who came second. So we manipulate the environment that may enable or may change the ways in which we can select our leaders as well. Add on top of that once more that we live in a global network now where information is coming from us, coming at us from everywhere. And a network in which likes and retweets and all of these things are valued, then misinformation, um, kind of extreme views get, get passed around these networks very quickly. And as an example of the power of the kind of wisdom of crowds, this is an ox in front of you here. There was a guy called Sir Francis Galton at the turn of the last century, and he went to a country fair, and there was a guess the weight of the ox competition. And Galton was interested in who, who was coming to this fair, was going to be more accurate at guessing the weight of the ox, whether it was the butcher or the accountant or the mathematician. And what he found when he took all of these guesses that no one person was, a good, was, was, was accurate. No one person got anywhere near the weight of the ox. But when he aggregated all of those guesses and took the median value, they were within one pound of the true value of the ox. Okay, so the collectively, the crowd knew the weight of the ox, but no one individual did. And this is a very well-known um, phenomenon that was called the wisdom of crowds. And we recreated this, and we did it with jars of sweets because we didn't have any oxes kicking around. Okay, so we had jars of sweets, and we said, how many sweets do you think are in the jar? And we averaged these guesses, and as group size went up, what we found is that the blue line, which is the real number of sweets in the jar, very, slow, very quickly got to that average. So the number of sweets in jars can be estimated very quickly with a large number of people. Except what we did in this experiment, in another version of it, was leak information into it. So we said to people, guess the number of sweets in the jar, but we told them what the last person guessed or we told them the average guess, or we told them a random guess. And as soon as you put information in that system which isn't their own, everyone overestimates the number of sweets in that jar. They completely think it's, there's way more sweets than there should be, both individuals and collectively. So you can overestimate the value of something. Okay, the point of all that I'd like to make is that we have a mismatch. We aren't too different from the animals which I study. We're simple fundamentally selfish, and we definitely hung over. We have these biases, these innate biases in how we select and follow people. The way we set up our decision-making processes to elect leaders and, and allow us to follow certain people can bias and sometimes bias us towards these sorts of heuristics. And also, we are in, a, in an age where information can very quickly be changed and altered because it passed through so many um, links in the network so quickly. So I like to think that when we're choosing our leaders in our sports teams, organizations, workplaces, political leaders, that we should take account of the biases which we have, overcome them, and select leaders which are fit for the environments in which we live in today.